welcome everyone to Bethel Baptist Church. Please take your songbook in front of you there and turn to number 106. 106, where you'll sing, Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Let's stand together as we sing. Father, we do indeed come here this morning to praise you, Lord. We are so thankful for the grace that you have shown towards us, Lord, and we're thankful, Lord, that each and every day we can praise you and we can know, Lord, that we can cast all of our cares upon you because we know that you care for us, Lord. And Lord, we just would pray that you would bless this meeting together today and over your word and that what is preached today would touch our hearts, Lord, and it would lead us and direct us and, and just help us to come closer to you, Lord. That's our goal, Lord, is to be more like our Lord and Savior, Lord, each and every day. And we just would pray that you would bless us, Lord. We would pray for those who aren't here today because of illness or other reasons, Lord, and we just pray for them and ask your blessing on them, Lord. We pray for those who may be traveling, that you would be with them as well. And Lord, we would just pray that everything that's done here, the song service, the preaching, everything that's done here today would bring glory and honor to you. And we ask all this in your most precious name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. We're in the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosened a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On, second, on such the second death hath no power, 
but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Philippians 2 talks about Jesus Christ, who he was being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In all of time there has never been such a condescension. That the Lord of all creation, the one who is holding the universe together, would descend to the lower parts of the earth to provide salvation to a creation, to a creature such as us, that had rejected and rebelled against him. Against all that would have been expected, that is what our God did for us. And that is what we find in the first two verses of our Song of the Month. It talks about God being the, 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 that he created every star, every planet, that it was fashioned by his hand. All creation is being held together by the power of his voice. That, it is that same God who is so far above creation, decided to descend to his creation to the point of letting them kill him on a cross. So all that are guilty may be set free from that guilt. What amazing love! Pay attention to verse 2 as we sing through this time, and you'll notice the, the theme that's there that we've just talked about. Let's stand together as we sing, Across the Lands.
God, despite our own weaknesses and our own failures, His faithfulness is ever true, and He is a He is great. I enjoyed the, the lyrics of the songs today and uh, worshiping together with you already. Um, good to have everybody out today. If you're a visitor, just encourage you to fill out a visitor's card in the back of the chair in front of you, so we can have a record of your visit. And uh, so, we're certainly glad you're here with us today. Um, I have a couple of announcements I need to make very quickly here. We have our annual congregational meeting and, and potluck yet next Sunday. We have four people that are planning on attending that apparently, <laughs> according to our uh, sign-up sheet. So that means we need a few more names. Um, I say four people, I guess it would be four families probably, but if you would please um, sign up on that on, that on the way out uh, today, that would be very helpful for us. Um, we would imagine that there would be more people than four, um, but. Um, Anyway, so please please sign up for that. Also, um, there's something I, I need to touch base with uh, parents of kids in junior church on. <clears throat> um, I don't. I'm not. I hope I'm not coming across as mean, um, but I'm trying to be really nice to the children's workers when I say this. If you would please head after church and one of you pick up, like one of you as as a, one of two parents. Pick up your kids is, if you can afterwards, and then fellowship. I think fellowship is great, and I don't want to diminish that, uh, but if you could fellowship with your kids around you rather than, I know that's harder, but um, I would just encourage you to please pick your kids up as soon as possible afterwards. Um, um, I've been asked by multiple people to make that announcement, and I put it off for at least a month. So uh, please, please do that if you can. Um, and uh, there's also all kinds of other things on the count on the on the uh, uh, bulletin here. Please read your bulletins, and we look forward to doing things together. Gentlemen, come forward for offering if you would, please. Lots of sickness. Um, not too much in our church, thankfully, but there are a few people there still sick. Lots of needs. Um, be aware of the needs that are around us. Um, Miss Mary, by the way, has been moved to. Um, uh, rehab facility, so uh, in in um, Crofton, so be in prayer for her, and and she is really would like visitors, so um, if you want to stop, if you would be able to stop by there, she would really appreciate that. And um, let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, just for the privilege of being here together. We thank you that you are our great God, and um, there is none that even close that even comes close to your likeness. And you're, we will have the privilege of knowing you for all of eternity. And we know that much of that knowledge that we will gain on this side of heaven, it will be as we observe Christ and the ways that he lived and dwelt among us. We thank you, Lord, for sending your own son to live a perfect life as our example and to die to pay the punishment for our sin. And we thank you, Lord, for um, the new life that we have in Christ. Lord, we thank you just for your many blessings to us. We thank you that you have given us and you have uh, a purpose for living. You have saved us not just for fire insurance, but for a purpose. And as we have looked at the last two weeks, and we'll look again today at your purpose in our lives of being faithful. I pray that you would teach us what you want us to know and remind us of things that perhaps we've known in the past but have easily gone to the back of our minds. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that today would be a day where they would, you would enlighten their hearts, you would draw them to yourself, you would cause them to see their own sin and their need of a Savior, and that they would see Christ as as the only one who has the ability to meet that need because of his own death on the cross and paying the punishment for our sin. 
And Lord, as we worship you together, even with our offerings, we pray that you would help us as we learned this past Wednesday to give uh, with a heart of gratitude and a heart of love for you, with a cheerfulness, not because we have to give, but we get to. And we thank you, Lord, for the, the um, I thank you for the faithful giving of folks in our church. And we pray for our missionaries around the world. And we pray, Lord, that you would um, use the gifts that we give both around the world and in our own community to reach people with the gospel of Christ and help us to be faithful in making disciples. And we pray, Lord, for all these things that we, you would be honored and glorified. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
For our final song before the message, we will be singing uh, number 455. 455, Come All Christians Be Committed. Let's stand together as we sing, and children at this time can be dismissed to do junior church. now and turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And we're going to be picking up here in verse 31 of Matthew 25. I do need to mention, just by way of announcement, we do have our congregational meeting, annual congregational meeting next um, Sunday. Uh, there are budgets in the back for you. I mentioned that last week. There are budgets in the back for you. Um, in the it's, on the, it's in the, the church office. There's a pocket with a door, and there's budgets there. And uh, so please grab one per family, and there's also de deacon nominate, or officer nominations out there as well uh, in the lobby. Um, take a look at those. If you have any questions or thoughts about any of that, please come and talk to me or a deacon or um, uh, for financial stuff, Amanda. Uh, talk to one of us. Um, the, I, if, especially if you have a simple question, it makes um, for a little bit smoother meeting if we don't have, um, I mean, there's no problem with asking questions in a meeting, but um, it's just a lot easier. A lot of things can sort of be figured out beforehand. So please, please do that. I used to say, I haven't said this in a while, but I used to say a good congregational meeting is one with no surprises. So um, that's you, that uh, most people understand exactly what I mean when I say that. So I encourage you to, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments or anything, Please talk to myself or deacons about that. That's why we put things out a couple weeks in advance. Matthew 25, 31. Finish, finish the phrase. Measure twice. Good. Okay. I wasn't the only one that was taught that phrase. Very well. Okay. Very good. Measure twice. Cut once. I was working for a carpentry uh, company for uh, one summer, and an experienced carp carpenter told me, that there's an easy difference between experienced carpenters and inexperienced carpenters. The experienced carpenters, they measure twice and what do they do? They cut once. The inexperienced carpenters measure once and have to cut twice and uh, end up wasting a lot of material that way. Well, um, if you think about it, can you just sort of imagine uh, in fact, let me ask you if you've ever done this before. Some of you guys that use saws and things. 
Have you ever um, measured something? And maybe you've even measured twice. And then you go and you, you go to cut, maybe you're using a, you know, a power miter saw or a circular saw or something, and you go to cut and you're like, did I measure right? And you're, you're kind of thinking, maybe I shouldn't, and you have to go, you got, ah, you gotta go measure again. How many of you have ever done that before? Okay, you've even measured twice, and you still, you're not confident in your own memory of the measurement that you just took, even though you measured twice. Well, if you know the measurement, if you're clear on that, have you ever said to somebody, hey, remember this measurement? But you didn't, you didn't tell them so that they would remind you. They to you told them because you figured if you said it out loud, you might remember it better. How many of you have ever done that before? Okay, good. We're all in the same boat here uh, with those kinds of things. You know, the more confident you are about the measurement, the more confident you are about making the cut, right? And it is, and I, I used an illustration that um, some of you may have never even used a, a power miter saw or a, or a circular saw, but I mean, you probably could do that with, there's all kinds of applications measuring, um, you know, for, for cooking or something, right? You measure once and or you measure, should measure or think through the measurements twice. I don't know, I don't cook, so you, you guys figure out the application for that. Um, I can cook eggs if I'm lucky, but that's about it. Sewing would be a better, okay, sewing would be better. Uh, yeah, because you cut fabric, that, that makes more sense. Well, if you think about it, there is a, a strong correlation between confidence and, no, and being able to measure something. 1 John 2, 28 says this, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. 1 John 4, 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Did you know that the God's desire for you is that you would have confidence when he appear, when Christ appears? And if you were to poll the average Christian that is aware of the coming of Christ, we have no idea when. And we, the Bible just tells us we need to be ready, and it could take longer than we expect. But, you know, if you talk to the average Christian about the coming of Christ, they're not that excited about it, if they're really honest with you. If you talk to the average Christian, I suspect that what you would find is a lack of confidence. And one of the reasons that that is probably true is because they, they are unaware of really how to measure their service for the Lord and what God is genuinely and, and actually expecting of them. If you think about it, an immature Christian often cuts twice and only measures once. In other words, he's really not aware. There, there are so many Christians that don't know. They're sort of not really spiritually mature. They really don't know what God expects. They're just running around doing all kinds of stuff and hoping that you know, it, they get it right. But there is a sense in which God wants us to know. To, to, there, is there some mystery to, the, to knowing what God wants us to do? I think there is. But the more that we know God, and the more we know His Word, the more confidence we have of what God expects of us. And we have noted in the last couple of weeks that if you can sum it up into one word, it really is the word what? Faithfulness. God expects of His children faithfulness. And we noted the first message that we looked at a couple of weeks ago was that God, expect, God desires for His children to be faithful. And the way that we, we, we remain on that path of faithfulness is to be constantly aware of the judgment of Christ, to be constantly aware of His coming. And if we would do things and think of things and talk about, and our speech would be in thinking about the coming of Christ as we do them, we will remain on that straight path of faithfulness in our lives. Last week we looked at the parable of the talents and the, and the concept of faithfulness in that passage. 
Let me just ask you a question. What is a talent? Does anybody remember what a talent is? In other words, uh, we know it's money in the in the in the in the illustrate in, in the in the parable. But what is the connection? What is it supposed to be for us? What is the talent? If you're unclear about that, let me just give you one word: responsibility. It's responsibility. It is the responsibility that God has given you. It is not the ability. It really isn't just talking about your possessions, though it may include that if you consider your possessions to be stewardship of your responsibility. But folks, understand that what God is talking about in that passage is, are we faithful with the responsibilities that God has given us? And if we are faithful with, with responsibilities, God will give us more responsibility. And it really ought, probably takes a mature Christian to want more responsibility. But if that doesn't happen in this life, it really is going to happen in the next life. We are always looking for what we don't have and asking and wanting what we think we wanting what we don't have instead of being faithful with what, with what God has already given us. We would do far better to simply say I am going to be faithful with the responsibilities that God has given me and God will give me greater responsibilities in his time. And we know we know clearly that what is in what is in light in all of this is the coming of Christ. And we see that in Matthew 25, verse 31 here. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And so we're now going to culminate all of this by looking at the actual coming of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask His blessing on our time together. Father, as we look at this passage, I pray that You would teach us the right measurement that ye Christ use, will use to measure our faithfulness. I pray that there would just be an increase in clarity about this in our own lives and minds and hearts about what you are looking for from us. We know, Lord, that we are incapable of even being faithful and that our faithfulness is contingent upon your faithfulness. But the only reason we know that we can be faithful is because you are truly always faithful. May our lives conform to yours. May we adjust to you. And I pray today, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, that you would help us to see with 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 a great deal of clarity and accuracy what, you're, what you want us to be faithful with. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. When looking at the passage, we pick up here that there is a change in, under, in, in how this is being written, in the genre this is being written. Some would say in verses 31 through 46 here that this is another parable. And I would really reject that idea completely, that this is not another parable that Christ is talking about. This is, he is now going to be talking about his own second coming. And the reason that we see that here is that he uses very specific terms like son of man and nations and angels. This is, not, this is a, a change in how he is, in the last couple of, narr couple of passages that we've looked at, in how he is approaching things. And we do see some symbolic kinds of phrase, uh, words here, like the word sheep, and goats, and there is some symbolism in here. And we'll look at what the, the identity of that symbolism is in a few moments. But overall, this is not a parable. This is an account, a prophetic account of the coming of Christ. Now I want you to notice a couple of things about this. Verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Verse 32, and behold, him shall be gathered all, what's the next word? Nations. Nations. And he shall separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats. I will admit to you that there's a lot of confusion about this passage and a lot of debate over, over the, the nature of it. Your, uh, some people would, would say that this is a judgment of the nations. 
problem with that is that after this mention of the nations in verse 32, you see no mention of the nations again in this passage. You see that he is dealing with individuals. He calls them sheep and goats. So I would suggest to you that although there is a national component here, and I think that's important to recognize, we're not talking about specifically a judgment of the nations because we find the rest of the passage dealing with individuals. I will say, though, and I think it's important to recognize, that this is, when Christ comes back, he is going to rule actual nations. And that's important to recognize. There are some good, godly people, Christians that would be our millennial friends, that would suggest that, that, that he isn't going to be doing this. So I would just encourage you to realize that he identifies nations, and there, there is going to be a ruling of the nations by Christ, but this particular passage, the primary role of this passage, if you look at all of the verses, you're not going to find that he is really judging the nations as a whole in this passage. But with that in mind, I do want us to take a look and see what this passage is talking about. I do believe what he's talking about here is the coming of Christ, just as he says, his second coming. And the most clear account of that is in the book of Revelation. So I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn there to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to pick up here and look at the coming of Christ. By the way, I would just note that from what I can tell when it comes to the Gospels, the rapture was really just not in view in the Gospels. We do find in Thessalonians it's mentioned, in 1 Corinthians 15 it's implied, but the concept of the rapture itself is not really mentioned I don't think in the Gospels. Some would have some would debate that. There's one place in Matthew 24 that you could kind of look at it possibly there, but as a whole, it's really not mentioned there. And in fact, the second set in the first century, and really after the first century, we don't know about the first. We don't know too much about the first century other than the New Testament. But second century, third century, fourth century, um, they really didn't see a rapture and then a second coming. It was really historically just they were looking to the coming of Christ. They did believe that it was going to be every, it seems like every generation believes it's going to be in their lifetime. And you see that in church history. Everybody thinks it's going to be in their lifetime. The first century Christians thought it would be in their lifetime. So what we're talking here in Matthew 20, 25, verses, picking up here in verse 31, is about the second coming of Christ. And we see here in, verse, in chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, we, as Kim read, we see an account of the second coming of Christ. Picking up here in verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to, of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him. What do you see there? How off, For how long? A thousand years. Now, I just want to say that you really can't get past this use of a thousand years multiple times in this chapter. And so I would just encourage you to have it set. When you're thinking about your eschatology, you're thinking about prophetic revelation, there are a lot of things that are very debatable. There are a lot of things that you could sort of, can't, hard to pinpoint and hard to really be hard fast about that, but I would just really encourage you to have it settled in your mind that there will be a literal thousand year millennial reign. And it will be Christ ruling the nations. That's the setting that we find ourselves in here. And Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years so that the work of Christ and the setting up of his kingdom can come to fruition. Verse 3 says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should receive, deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw the throne. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judge, judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon the, their foreheads, or in their he, hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now what he's talking about here is at this point we have what's called the first resurrection where all of those who know Christ as their Savior will, will rise from the grave. 
Those who believe in a, in a rapture prior to this point would suggest that you have sort of a, two, a two-tiered resurrection. They're both the first resurrection. And so those who are raptured uh, two, seven years prior to the tribulation, they also are, that is part of the re resurrection. So you sort of have two phases of this one resurrection. And so that's what we're talking about here. The first resurrection is everyone. However, in this context, what we're talking about here is the second coming of Christ after the tribulation period and, and right here while, as he begins to reign. This is the coming, the second coming of Christ that we're talking about. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he, uh, is he that ha hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. What is the second death, by the way? Spiritual death. It's hell. We're going to see that later on in the passage. Hell is cast into the lake of fire, in fact, in this passage. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, I want you to notice that what we are going to have here in verse, uh, verse we're going to look at, uh, we're not going to, our, our purposes here are not to look at all of the, the work of the, of the millennial kingdom, of course, but in verses 11 through 15, you're going to have a judgment there. That is the great white throne judgment that is mentioned there. And I just want to mention here that what we're, the judgment that we're talking about in this passage in Matthew 25 is not this judgment. It's not the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is toward unbelievers, and it is after the millennial kingdom, has been, or toward the end of the millennial kingdom. Now, with all that in mind, let's go back to Matthew 25. So what we've established here, folks, is that what we're dealing with is the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and what we have here inseparably linked to the coming of Christ is a judgment. There is judgment involved in this. And what we find here is the nature of this judgment. And so we see the timing of it is the second coming of Christ. And the term, and, and then we see that it's not the great white throne judgment, but it is the judgment, and what is the measure of the judgment? Well, it is faithfulness, according to the context of the rest of the chapter. So the judgment that he's, with which he's judging is faithfulness, and we're going to see more, we're going to narrow this down a little bit more. Now the question in your minds, at least some of your minds, would probably be raised at this point, is this speaking of the judgment seat of Christ here? And my answer to that is maybe... It's really the best I can give you. The reason I say that, folks, is because, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and have you turn there. Would you turn to Romans 14? I want you to see this. This is the first time that the word, the term judgment seat of Christ is used in the New Testament. And I want you to see how it is used. It is used in context of judging a brother in Christ. Now, there's, there is some clear application there for us. But in verse 10 it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand. So in other words, don't be very careful with judging brothers and sisters in Christ. Be very careful with that. You make sure that it is objective and verifiable. Don't just assume that you know what's going on. There's got to be something that is very clear when it comes to these, that, those kinds of judgments. And the word there actually is the word condemn. We ought never be condemning brothers and sisters in Christ. Why do we not need to do this? Because there will be a judgment where it won't there. We don't have to judge our brothers and sisters in Christ because there will be one day where Christ will judge all. And we see here, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord. Now notice what happens here. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, let me ask you a question. When will every knee bow and every one confess that Jesus is Lord? When will that happen? At the second coming of Christ, where the, the nations will be, actually they'll be forced to, de to know or to, to affirm that Jesus is is Christ, he is the Lord, and he will then rule and reign for a thousand years. It's interesting that Paul makes that connection between the judgment seat of Christ and 
and the, the, the time where all will bow. Is it conclusive then that what we're going to be talking about here is the judgment seat of Christ? It's not conclusive. But it is interesting. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 through 10 says, For we are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. And that is the point, isn't it? Um, for we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, whenever you believe the judgment seat of Christ is, the point that we need to simply make here is that we will give account of the things that, we are done, that are done in the body as believers. And the question that we ought to have for ourselves is, how, is our work, how are our works going to be measured? And we've already noted that it is going to be by the faithfulness of the responsibilities that God has given us. But specifically, what kind of responsibility would he give us? And that is what our, our text is going to answer for us in Matthew 25. So if you take your Bible and turn back there, if you're not already there, Matthew 25, and we're going to see some action on the part of this Son of Man who we know to be Jesus Christ. And he is going to divide, it says, the sheep from the goats at the end of 32 and verse 33. And he shall set the sheep, verse 33, on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. Now immediately what we see here is he's, going to, he's using this term sheep and goats in, in an illustrative manner. We are, we are not talking here, of course, about literal sheep and literal goats. Of course, that's the case because now the sheep are going to speak back to him. And the goats are going to speak to him. So that's, we know that's not what he's talking about here. Where he's, he's referencing some group or body of people. And the question then becomes, first of all, who are these sheep? And by the way, this is very well debated. But let's answer the question the best we can with, with some references that Christ has already used in describing what the sheep is. Now, don't take the take. I mean, you don't feel like you have to take the time to turn to some of these passages because we're going to go through a lot quickly. But you, if you want to write down the references, feel free to do that or turn to them if you want. But I, I'm not going to go at the pace necessarily that you'll be able to do. Christ uses this term "sheep" to actually describe in one set, in one place lost people. He says in Matthew 9:36, "But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them." Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he to the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. And so he's talking there about people that have no shepherd. And he says they are as sheep that have no shepherd. But he doesn't specifically call them sheep. He says they're as sheep that have no shepherd. We find that this term in the Old Testament in Psalm 79, 13, is used to describe the nation of Israel, where it says, So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. And so we see the nation of Israel is, is called the sheep of, of God. Matthew 15, 24 says, And he answered and said, I am not sent but to but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in Matthew 10, 6, 7 it says, But go rather the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And because of this, there would be some that would actually believe that the sheep that he is talking about here is the nation of Israel. The problem here is that there is nowhere in Scripture that he directly refers to the nation, as far as I can find, refers to the nation as sheep. But he does do that to another group of people. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Matthew chapter 10. Would you turn there? Matthew chapter 10. You just get a few, few chapters back here. About 15 chapters back. Verse 16. He tells the disciples, he says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So he calls them sheep and he contrasts them with wolves. Those who would actually be wanting to deceive people from turning to Christ. 
In Matthew 18, verses 13 through 15, we find another reference. So we kind of need to turn just a few more chapters back that way, back the other direction to Matthew 18, verse 13. And if ye be, be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than the ninety and nine which went astray. He's talking about going after the lost sheep that went astray. Even so, it, it is the will of your Father which is in heaven. That the, that, and notice the term here, verse 15, 14, this is important. Keep this term in your mind. He calls the lost sheep, which are his sheep, he calls them what? One of, the lead, one of these little ones. You're going, to have, you're going to need to remember that term. So he calls the sheep the little ones, he said, should perish. Moreover, if thy bro And then he goes right into verse 15, he says, Moreover, thy brother trespass against thee. He makes a direct connection between God's children and sheep. And he calls a sheep that is straying a little one. All right? You see all those connections. We're gonna, those are going to become important in just a few moments. Definitively, though, folks, he is talking here about his children, both Jew and Gentile. And we know that from John chapter 10. Maybe you're familiar with the verses that, that really are one of the, some of the greatest verses for eternal security. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. In verse 16 of that chapter, he says, not only that he, he has sheep that are of the nation of Israel, but he says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. My whole point is, is simply this. Folks, I think without a doubt, my conclusion is that the sheep here are talking about people that are Christ's. Both Jew and Gentile. These are people that know Christ as their Savior. They are disciples of Christ. They're identified that way. And this is consistent with what we have learned, even Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, if you'll remember, where Christ has come so that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, according to verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 2, Ephesians 2, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, which says, Wherefore remember they that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no, no hope, and without God in the world, have now been joined into one body. So what are we talking about here when we're talking about sheep? We're talking about all those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. They are the sheep. I don't see any evidence to describe anything else. And what we find here, well, what are the goats then by, by definite? We don't have to discuss a lot about what the goats are. We, we've looked so much at what the sheep are. What are the goats? Well, the goats are ones who have rejected Christ. They're the ones who are not um, who are not uh, faithful to Christ. And so now we're going to, with all of that in mind, it's going to give us a little bit of bearing here. The sheep are one day going to be us, as well as all those who have genuinely accepted Christ by faith in the nation of Israel. It will all, he'll be looking at, he'll be, he'll be identifying the sheep that way and judging the sheep that way. Now, with all of that in mind, turn to Matthew, back to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And look here then at verse uh, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand. So who's on his right hand? It's the sheep, right? Come ye blessed of my father. And he says to them that they're going to do what? They're going to inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Folks, what do you know from what you know of the New Testament, who is going to be inheriting who who is going to be receiving the inheritance of Christ? 
It is going to be those who know Christ as their Savior. We know that, for example, from Romans 8, 17, which says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Galatians 3.29 says, If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Titus 3.7 says that being justified by His grace, we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Christ says to those who are His true sheep, he says, you will inherit, you can now receive your inheritance. And there's no question in my mind, folks, that that is us. It includes, I think, those who have genuinely trusted Christ and received the revelation that they had received, that they had, had from the, from uh, back in the Old Testament through us. It's all now going to be combined together here. Now, that's a lot of detail, isn't it? We just went through a lot of different passages, and the reason I felt it necessary to go through all those passages is that I don't want there to be any wiggle room. I mean, really. If, if there's any wiggle room, you're, you're now going to assume that this has got to be talking about somebody else besides us. I don't think this is talking about anybody besides us, uh, except for the nation. I mean, I think it's all of us. Now, with that in mind, we begin to see what Christ why Christ is going to give his inheritance to these folks. Look at verse 35. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when, we saw, uh, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, or came unto thee? The king answered and, said, answered and say unto him, I'm sorry, the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, notice that phrase, least of these. Do you remember that phrase before? Okay. The least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The king, the judge, Jesus Christ himself, says to these sheep who were surprised that they so directly ministered to Christ himself, though they never saw him bodily before. How did they do this? They did this by, and we're going to look at this in a minute, but they did this by ministering to the least of these. Whatever the least of these means. He did, they did this by ministering to those who were in need in that way. And Christ summarizes some of the needs. I don't think this is all of them, but this is a good summary of the kinds of needs that if we choose to meet toward this particular group of people, which we're going to look at in a minute, if we summarize those, then that will be of great... It's as though, folks, we are doing it to Christ. If we're hungry, that's somebody that needs food, or somebody that needs drink, or somebody who's a stranger, somebody who's just estranged or lonely, someone who is naked or, uh, and needs clothing, someone who is sick, someone who is in prison... These are people with genuine needs. He says, when you meet the needs of this group of people, which we're going to look at the, identi the identity of this group of people in a minute, when you meet these needs, you it is as though you are meeting Christ's needs himself. And that is what we are going to stand as a judgment for. Now, we had then better, if that's the case, we had then better figure out who in the world... And by the way, let me just say this. This is just by way of application. Did you notice that the sheep, the right people on the right hand, these people had no idea that they were so ministering to Christ in this way. Isn't that true? They said, oh Lord, why did we do this? And I just want to make an application here. True ministry, the results of true ministry are very often not seen on this side of heaven. 
There are so many Christians who get so discouraged when they don't see results from their labors. But God said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And there's a promise for us that are doing that, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The results of ministry are often not seen in this life. They're not seen until the next life. I am convinced that some of the most faithful Christians will never receive notoriety or accolades or anything in this life, but we will see maybe even a reverse of what we see in this life in the next life. The question is, folks, not are, are we seeing results of our service. The question is, are we serving faithfully? And what we are doing, even if we're doing, and it may even have negative results on us, or on it may even seem to be negative toward the person, at least in the, in the short term. Um, we don't know the, the results ultimately. I just want to give one illustration and then we'll move on here because we have a lot to cover. Um, there are many, many times in, minist in my ministry so far that I have felt discouraged over the lack of results of trying to do what is right and being faithful and, and things. Um, I was working, I remember working as an administrator at Christian school as assistant pastor and, um, and every day working with kids that I felt as though they were not listening. <laughs> Parents, you ever feel that way? Um, <laughs> I just felt as though nothing was getting through to them. And at the time, I don't think anything was. But I remember working at Chick-fil-A when I was doing that for three years in between ministries. Um, somebody that was in my class came up to me like to order a chicken sandwich and said, Pastor Jim. And I, I said, oh, hi. And uh, she said, I just want, she ordered her food and then she just stopped and she said, just want to tell you, we didn't listen to you back then. <laughs> but um, it really made an impact on my life. And I realized that what you were tell trying to tell us um, uh, really came, it, it became really true for me later. My point in saying that, folks, is you just, you just need to be faithful. And God gives us glimpses of the results in this life. But we will not see, if we're faithful, more than likely we will not see the half of the results that, that are, are true, spiritual, non-tangible, non-visible results until the next life. And most of true biblical service is not tangible and not visible. It's something that works and that is working in the heart of an individual. Now, the question then becomes, who do we need to meet these needs to? Who are the least of these? Well, there's several proposed, I'd like just to suggest a couple of, or several pro proposed view. The most common view is that it's talking here about anyone in need. In fact, you even have secular uh, people that would not name the name of Christ that like this, this talking about this, and they apply it to world hunger and apply it to needs all over, all over the world. And so we need to bring a cup of cold water to people in Africa that are starving or other places. And so that's what it's talking about here. Some would say that this is talking about Jewish people, as we have already mentioned. Or the least of these is talking about Jewish people, actually. Some would say, no, this is got to at least be talking about Jewish Christians. And there are others that would say, this is just people that are pro-Israel, those people would say that this is a judgment of the nations. The focus here is the nations. And so these are just pro-Israel. And whoever sides with Israel, those are the people that are, going to be, um, that are going to be blessed. And those who don't side with Israel are going to be cursed. Well, um, I, and then some people say that this is talking about apostles and missionaries specifically. And I just want to suggest to you that none of these are right. That all of these are things that are suggested, but I think that there is a far more, um, far better right view, <laughs> as I'm going to put here uh, up on the screen. Uh, so here you're going to learn the right view. 
Um, and if you don't agree with me, that's certainly okay, but I think you should. Um, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 18. There's a little bit of joking in that. I hope you, I hope you gather that. But Matthew 18. Remember I said, remember I had you identify that term, least of these, in connection with disciples, talking about the lost sheep that went astray in John, um, no, is, that, is it Matthew there? Matthew uh, 18, actually. Well, I want you to see here, we're going to turn here to Matthew 18, and there is actually a grammatical link between the little ones in Matthew 18 and the least of these in Matthew 25. And I'll spare those of you non-grammarians of explaining the grammatical link. But I just want to identify that there is a link here. So then the question becomes, what is this little ones? Matthew 18, verse 1 says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be, what's the next word, folks? Converted. And become as, a little chi as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who so there therefore shall humble himself as this little child? The same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one, one such little one in my name receiveth me. Do you see the connection there? But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believeth, believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, folks, what we see here then, isn't it true, folks, that what we're talking here is about those who are converted, those who are God's children, Christ says, what you do to a child of God, you do to me. If you receive him, you've received me. If you've offended him, that means to cause him to stumble. It's not offended as in hurt feelings. To cause him to stumble, you have also, you have also done so to me. It's a very serious consideration, isn't it? But it identifies for us who the least of these. Now, if you're not convinced... I'll also remind you that Christ says the least of these, what are the next two words? Do you remember over the passage? Some of you are looking, my brethren. Do you remember that? He says, whoever is done to the least of these, my brethren. Well, who does he call his brethren? Well, he calls his disciples his brethren, according to Matthew 12, 24 through 50. He says, while ye yet talk to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak to him. And one said unto them, Behold, my, thy mother and thy brother stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them, him, and told him, Who is my mother and who is my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. And whoso shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. He says that his followers, his disciples, are his brethren in that passage. Why am I saying all this? And why is this so important? Well, you cannot, you cannot get the weight of this passage unless you are really convinced of what he is really saying here. Now let me just expand this, or maybe the better word is is develop this concept even more. Do you remember over in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is, is on the road, okay, to Damascus. And he is stopped by who? It was by Christ himself. And do you remember what, he said, what Christ says to him? Saul, Saul, why per persecutest who? Thou me. Who was he talking about? Well, Saul didn't directly persecute the actual, the actual person of Christ. He persecuted who? The church. In Ephesians, we find that, the, that Paul's favorite um, term for the church is Christ's body. Folks, what are we talking about here? We are talking here about the reality that how we relate to other brothers and sisters in Christ in the body is going to be the measurement 
with how we are judged in our faithfulness at the judgment. That is of great significance, isn't it? That's why in 1 John 4, he says in verse 7, John says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye love also love one another. But this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye love one another. From whom the whole, and then it, it says in Ephesians 4.16, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supply, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase in the body unto the edifying of itself self in love. Beloved, let us love one another, 1 John 4, 7. For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And in the context, he's talking about love for the brethren. Do you realize, folks, the significance of this? Who are these little ones? These little ones are other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, what I'm, I'm suggesting to you is both the sheep are the, are the disciples and the little ones are, or the least of these in the Matthew passage, Matthew 25, and the least of these are also disciples of Christ. And there will be some that would, would object and say, well, how can there, not, there's, there's not enough distinction between those two. Does there need to be? I mean, when you really think about it, isn't, doesn't every sheep have needs? Doesn't every brother and sister in Christ have needs? The answer would be yes. And we see a direct connection between how you treat them with how you treat Christ. And, Christ, and, the, and the key here is this, as we narrow this down, that is our measurement. Can I ask you a question, brothers and sisters in Christ? How have you treated your brother and sister in Christ? And how are you treating your brothers and sisters in Christ? If you expand this application, you can easily say that a person, that is not in, not, a person who is not vitally linked to a local church is going to have a very, very hard time with, with really being faithful to what God expects of us. Ultimately, God has a greater plan. His greater plan is that when we have this kind of meeting each other's needs in the body that God wants us to have, and we are faithfully doing so, we are the light that God intended, first for the nation of Israel, though they never could, could, could be faithful in. And God intended secondarily, and, and, and uh, not secondarily uh, in a sense of value, but but. Finally, uh, with the church, God wants us to be a light in the world. The way that we are doing that, that we do that, is that, God, that people see a difference in our lives because of our love one for another, and that love is our giving of ourselves to each other. So folks, what is the responsibility in the previous passage that we learned? That responsibility is how we are meeting our, meeting our brothers and sisters in Christ's needs. And I would just ask you a question. How are you doing? Would you look back on 2014, for example, and say, you know, there are many times that I have been attentive to the needs of my brothers and sisters in Christ. There are many times where I have chosen to meet those needs God's measurement of faithfulness in our application, God's measurement of faithfulness is meeting the needs of Christ by meeting the needs of His body, His brothers and sisters in Christ. Number two, how do you know the needs of the body? If our responsibility is to meet the needs of the body of believers in Christ, if that's our responsibility, if that's the litmus test, if that's the measurement, with which we are going to be measured someday. How do you do that? You've got to, number one, we've got to know each other. You can't meet someone's needs unless you know them. We are living in a society that it's becoming harder and harder to know each other. Isn't that true? To really know each other. And I would just say this, that the one place 
if everything else kind of breaks down and you don't have, or my dad and I were talking about this a couple days ago, if everything else breaks down and you don't have, you know, little mom and pop shops anymore where people get together or barbers, like, you can't cut your hair online, so that's probably going to be around for a while. Um, but um, other things like that where you're having sort of little communities and, and things like that where you get to know people within a community, the church ought to be there. The church ought to be re remain faithful. And there ought to be a sense in which we understand that we cannot meet the needs faithfully of each other unless we know them. And we can't know them unless we know each other. It is not right for us to sort of stay in our corner and to just say, I'm going to do my own thing. I was, we heard of a person just recently who decided he was going to go to three different churches and just kind of rotate them. And uh, listen to sermons on the side in case he didn't like the ones that he was listening to from the three different churches. I mean, how are you ever going to get to know anybody if you're going to three different churches all the time? There is a serious problem in our thinking when it comes to this kind of thing. And what we've got to understand is our responsibility. Are we setting up our lives this way? Are we choosing to, to arrange our lives so that we have time to know people, to know their needs, to be able to meet those needs? There are physical needs that people need, but there, folks, there are intangible needs. And in, fra fra in fact, my experience has been that there's probably more intangible needs than there are tangible needs. There are people that are hurting and discouraged and struggling and failing in areas. There are people with all kinds of needs in our church and in our churches, in, our bo in, in the body at large. And, there, and, and you and I have the responsibility to meet those needs, and God has actually gifted us to do that by giving us a spiritual gift. Because the purpose of a spiritual gift, as we've already identified in the book of Ephesians, is to edify, to build up the body of Christ. What is the measurement with which God will choose that we be faithful? God will make, uh, look at to, be, to see if we're faithful are we consistently meeting the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ? You say, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, if that's the case, um, come talk to me. <laughs> and I'll help you learn how to do it. Or perhaps you say, well, I just don't feel as though there's anything I can do. You know one thing that you can always do? You can always pray. If somebody comes to me and says, you know what, I don't feel as though I don't have I feel as though I don't have any ministry or anything I can do. There's so many people, there's so many talent, much more talented than I am. Occasionally I get that. Um, which I don't really believe that much. But um, I often say to them, well, look, are you praying for people? Everybody can pray for people. <laughs> and you say, maybe somebody says, No, I, I'm not praying. But why aren't you praying? You know why we are not praying? Because we don't know what the needs are. That's why I think Wednesday night prayer meeting is so absolutely essential, if possible. I mean, sometimes it's not possible, and that's between you and the Lord, and I'm not judging any, that's not my point here. But man, I tell you what, I don't know how you're, how you're going to know, know the needs of the body if you're only here once a week. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to, you know, there's no, you know, it's not like I'm talking about sin here or anything like that, but there is something very good about meeting together and expressing our needs in the body and then being able to meet those needs through prayer in other ways. Even in some of the things that we're doing this coming year with, with game nights and, and just getting together for the men's and women's Bible studies and all those kinds of things give us opportunity to get to know each other so that we can know the needs and then we can identify when we are able to meet those needs. But I also want to just say this. I, I want to say how much I'm thankful that, that I, have, I get to observe more of this than most of you. Um, I get to observe when one person in the body is meeting the need of another person in the body. Not always, and I don't need it always, no. But sometimes I probably know a little more than others. And I want to also just commend, some of you are, you are meeting the needs of people in the body. And I just want to encourage you and thank you for how you are doing that faithfully. And it is being much, and I think it is appreciated by many. And, and uh, so I really encourage you, keep doing that. Some of you are just being very faithful with that. And just keep doing that. 
Because when you do it to, a, to the least of these, my brethren, you do it to Christ. Imagine the kind of reward you're going to receive when you're faithfully meeting the needs of brothers and sisters in Christ. I just want to mention this as well. We don't really need to discuss a lot about the goats here in this passage, except to say that the goats were not the sheep. The goats couldn't have been faithful to Christ because they didn't know Christ. And the goats in the passage are people that never came to a place where they knew Christ. And if you're saying to yourself, you know, I don't really know if I know God through His Son, Jesus Christ, then you need to know Him. The Bible says that these things are written that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God doesn't want you to wonder. He wants you to have confidence at His coming. And the first step to confidence is His coming is to know Him. And you can know Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus came to earth. Who, Jesus, who is God, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died to pay the punishment for your sins, so that your sins could be removed, so that you could be rightly related to God. And He rose from the grave to prove that He is victorious over sin and death. And you can be too if you'll accept Him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that as many as received Him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. If you have not made a decision for that for Christ, let me just encourage you, come and talk to me. I'd be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you can have confidence at the judgment and know God. Let's pray. Actually, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I would really like to just give you a couple of minutes of complete silence just to pray to the Lord. Maybe you're saying to yourself, you know, I have not been as attentive to the needs of the body as I need to be. If that is the measurement of faithfulness that God is going to be measuring me by, Christ is going to be measuring me by, I need, I need help in this area. I just give you a, a couple minutes just to, in your own, in own reflection before the Lord, to just pray to the Lord and say, Lord, would you help me to be attentive to the needs of others and help me to know people and know their needs Help me to be able to do that. Guide me so that I can use my spiritual gift in the body. I just want to give you a minute or two to do that. Father, I do pray that you would help us as individuals to fulfill our responsibility. <clears throat> to you by showing love and meeting the needs of your people. I pray, Lord, that you would um, help us to maybe consider or reconsider our schedules to give us time to do this. And if there's no way of doing that, I pray that in your time you would open up the ability to do that. I pray, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for how different people in our church do, do do this in different ways with different gifts. And I thank you for our church that is really doing a, a good job at meeting the needs of each other. But I pray, Lord, I know we could do better. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to do better. And um, that we wouldn't do it in our own strength, but we would do it out of a love for you, knowing that when we meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are doing it to you. Thank you for that knowledge and that understanding so that we can have an accurate measurement of what you genuinely expect of us and desire for us. We know that it is more blessed to give than to receive. The more we give, the more blessed we are. I pray that you would help us to have that kind of mentality. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.